Hey everyone, welcome back to Rabble. Uh, I'm Sean, as you can see, I'm by myself today uh, because things have been crazy. Uh, I say that like every time we film a video, but in the last couple weeks, things have really just jumped to a whole another level. My brother's getting ready to go off to college, um, so that's great. I'm really excited for him, been helping him out with that. And then we've had some technical difficulties, so we have like three or four videos that we just had to scrap because it just didn't work out. So. Um, what we decided to do this year is um, I'm going to try my hand at doing some weekly reactions to one of my favorite shows of all time, Game of Thrones. Now, usually I watch Game of Thrones at the end of the season in one binge watch session, just like all 10 episodes back to back to back to back to back. That's how I started watching Game of Thrones. I got in about season three. And ever since then, I haven't ever really been able to just devote myself week by week to hanging on cliffhanger after cliffhanger but this season there's only seven episodes left uh well there's only seven episodes total for season seven see seven eight well, there's less than 10 episodes so i felt like i can do that like i can i can make it for seven episodes and also because i wanted to try getting my hand into kind of reacting to it and talking a little bit about what i think the storyline is is going where i think the storyline is going and what's going to happen to the characters we did do one for episode one uh like I said, the technical difficulties kind of got into the way of it. If it ever kind of comes up, if anybody ever really hits me up and says they want to see it, I, I may post it. Uh, but at this point, I mean, it's so old that who cares? Episode two just didn't happen. So, um, which is fine because episode three is by far the best episode of the season. Um, the Queen's Justice is far and away way better than episode two. Episode two was one of the few Game of Thrones episodes that actually almost put me to sleep. I think part of it had to do with it focusing on characters that I don't particularly like. Um, it was slow buildup, which you expect, but it's, it is kind of concerning because since there's only a limited number of episodes this season, you kind of want something important to happen every episode. Something important did happen in, in episode two, but it happened towards the end, and I don't really... I actually actively hate Theon. Don't care for Euron. Don't care for Ilaria or the Sand Snakes. Yara's okay. So nothing about it really grasped my attention. They got their ships taken over. Ilaria and Yara and all that stuff got taken captive. Uh, I don't really care. And so it was one of the least interesting battles to watch, in my opinion. So it was just, it wasn't a good matchup for me. Episode 3, though, on the other hand packed full of tons of stuff that we as fans have been waiting to see for the longest time. Johnny and Dan, wow. John and Daenerys, um, <laughs> finally back uh, in, in the same location or in the same location for the first time. Tyrion and John back together. It's just full of stuff that I can't wait to discuss. And even though I'm by myself, without further ado, I'm gonna jump into it right now. We immediately have to start off with what happened on Dragonstone. Daenerys and Jon meeting together, two probably Targaryens together for the first time since the show has started, you know. Um, but there are some significant things going on with Danny and her, her camp that definitely need to be discussed. And the first thing I'm going to jump into is, is Danny getting sabotaged? Because I knew that there was no way that the creators and the writers of the show would have her just completely dominate this war like we expected her to it would be not interesting to see it would be too easy and the conflict wouldn't really provide a good sense of drama but i did not expect Cersei to come out of the gate with like two wins in a row and solidly take advantage of this war that hasn't really been much of a contest yet that being said is this Cersei? Like, who's advising her? She always seems one step ahead and danny seems one step behind obviously she seems to be taking most of her wisdom or whatever from Tyrion and I can't think that he would have anything to do with giving Cersei an advantage over Danny. but that being said maybe somebody else somewhere along the line is like leaking information I don't think Elena Tyrell would I definitely don't think Ilaria would I doubt that Yara would as well so maybe it's somebody that's like a little bit lower on that rung that is leaking information of course it could be virus but that almost seems too easy, and I can't imagine why he would all of a sudden not want Daenerys to be on the throne unless he feels like there's a better candidate elsewhere. He hasn't let on that there could be, but it is it is like super confusing to me that 
Danny just keeps getting all her ships taken and burned. Um, they did take Casterly Rock, but as you saw, it was pretty much a, a trap for the Unsullied. They they walked in, they took it fairly easily. Um, I'll get into that a little bit later, but it turned out not to amount to anything, and now they're pretty much trapped there. So, and the rest of Danny's fleet is getting burned. Other than that, in this in this episode, I mean, there's so much that's interesting that's happening with her with virus. I mean, all the people around her, it's it's great to see all these characters that have been spread out all over the series for the whole run, and now they're finally being brought back together so they can bounce off of each other. Varys is perplexing to me a little bit because his whole thing for the entire series has been he's one step ahead of everybody. Lately, he seems like he's kind of losing his touch. He seems like he's always finding out new information for the first time. Uh, Melisandre definitely threw him off this past week. I don't know if it was the mention of him dying. I don't know if it was the mention of his his prior um, run-in with that that creepy wizard that like castrated him as a kid, or if he was shook about the ship that was coming back in. Almost like he he didn't know that they were going to get burned, or he didn't have a sense of where Euron would strike. But he's definitely losing that sense of kind of invincibility that he's had in terms of being one step ahead of everybody. I think it can't be a coincidence that the other character like that, Peter Baelish, also seems to be losing his, his touch a little bit. Maybe there's something else at play. Like maybe there's another string puller that we're not really aware of that's basically outperforming those two. It was really cool to see Daenerys recognize after those those losses that she has a massive advantage with the dragons, but not having other dragon riders is a problem. Like, she can't just hop on Drogon and go flying off across the sea and hope to burn all these ships because, as they said, you know, the dragons are hard to take down, but she's not. And if they at any time lost her, then the whole cause is lost. But there's not anybody else that can fly them yet. There's definitely got to be some other dragon rider that picks up. And I can't, I don't think it can be a coincidence that Jon and Tyrion are now on Dragonstone. And both of them seem to have some sort of ability potentially to connect with dragons. Tyrion's always liked dragons. He was able to approach them, you know, last season and unchain them, which I don't think a lot of characters would have been able to do. Jon, being pro most likely part Targaryen at this point, also may have the ability to approach and ride and, and you know, control a dragon. Then there's Bran. A lot of people think maybe he'll warg into him, but that's something that Daenerys is going to have to get a handle on because she can't just ride off and be this superhero conqueror all the time. She's got to recognize that she has to delegate some of these tasks to other people. Hindsight is twenty twenty, and she definitely should have taken King's Landing right off the bat and been done with the whole thing. There's no reason for her to drag this whole thing out. She doesn't want to kill random innocent people, but wasting all these soldiers on, in her opposition and in her own camp, and she's losing allies left and right, these people that would have supported her reign if she wins and is able to take over, is almost worse. All you needed to do was fly into King's Landing, surround the Red Keep, and the whole thing is done. At worst, you may wind up burning the castle, but who cares? You know, th this whole drawn-out situation where she's losing all these battles and, and people are getting taken captured and getting defeated in the field and dying, she's kind of become a hypocrite, I think, in that sense. And because she's making something harder than it needs to be. For example, the Unsullied. They have this great plan. Tyrion knows the sewer system of Casterly Rock. He knows it like the back of his hand. He's going to use that information to give the Unsullied a way into the castle that isn't known so that they can take it over quite quickly with minimal loss of life. But yet and still, they still send a whole other host army of Unsullied to storm the walls of the castle and basically, I guess, create a distraction get completely beat down before they're allowed to be let in. But why didn't they just go in at night with a small group of Unsullied, take the castle, and be done with it? They left the ships out in the bay apparently unprotected. They couldn't see Euron and his forces sneak up behind them and start burning stuff. Also, with, with these ships, why don't they seem to have any offensive capabilities? Euron has managed to walk up to these ships, or sail up to these ships, and just start throwing fireballs and completely obliterate them, but they're supposed to come from the same people. Like, the Greyjoys are supposed to be these master sailors. The Dornish are supposed to have an impressive fleet. So I don't understand how Euron keeps completely obliterating these other fleets. It's different if he's winning the battle, but it's not even, it's not even a fight. Like, there's, 
there's one or two ships that are making it out of these situations tops. And Euron is pretty much just like sailing off into the sunset with all this plunder and no casualty. But it, the whole Castle Rock battle was a disappointment, honestly. In an episode that was chock full of stuff that we've been waiting to see, Castle Rock was very high on the top of my list. Uh, we've heard a lot about it, but we haven't seen it yet. And based on the description of it in the books, and, and this, I guess, is kind of where being a book reader does suck because you have this image in your head, but this thing is supposed to be huge. Castle Rock is supposed to be basically on this cliff, like built into the, this, this sheer cliff face that's higher than the wall. And that was definitely not it. I mean, they, they put the ladders up there and were just about to scale up that. It was super disappointing to have the Lannisters be this like, completely overhyped family with all this 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 wealth and all this power in one of what's possibly supposed to be the most impressive castle in the seven kingdoms and that's what we got i understand they have a budget that they have to hit and surely they're saving some of that money for some of the later episodes but they could have done something more here between that and and house tyrell um a high garden it was all disappointing because those are some of the places that we've been dying to see for the longest time. And it, it just wasn't, it wasn't impressive in any way. I mean, I don't know if they don't want to overshadow like Dragonstone or Winterfell. At least something more imaginative with the castle design. Castle Rock is basically supposed to be like built into this, this castle, this uh, cliff face. And it almost is supposed to look like, like a lion, you know, itself. And, and that was distinctly not even close to description in the book. Um, and it also looked like it was just kind of sitting out in this field. Like there was no city like underneath it or anything. Um, so that was that was disappointing. I will also say this. I am not a huge geography buff. I'm not I'm not terrible about letting my mind just kind of relax and enjoy a show. Um, and in the past, a lot of people have commented and complained about the way characters just kind of like warp around uh, the world. And then these armies just kind of pop up wherever they need to be. I've been willing to let that go for the most part in past seasons because you're not necessarily sure that everything you're seeing is happening at the same time. Now that all these characters are together and they're talking about these events in sequence, we're pretty sure that this stuff is happening within a couple of days of each other. And it is getting ridiculous. The Unsullied is able to like sail over here and then Euron's over here and he pops up back over here and his fleet is there and... It, it's gotten a little bit ridiculous and considering that we see a map of Westeros every time the episode starts we do know that these places are not at all close enough together for that to be realistic I know it's the last season but they could do a little bit more about explaining how these events are happening so close together and these characters I mean even if it's just like saying oh it's been I don't know a week instead of a couple of days when they don't say anything, it does make the audience feel like we're just not supposed to buy anything as, as, as realistic anymore. It is a show about dragons, though, so I guess that's that's kind of on us. But still, so John and Danny meeting was perfection. Everything I like about Game of Thrones, just the cinematography of them rowing up to the shore and then that long walk up the pathway to Dragonstone was beautiful the the verbal interaction between Tyrion and Jon and Missande and Davos and and Daenerys just fantastic Game of Thrones at the highest level and I was really happy with the way Jon was portrayed in this episode I was happy to see him stand his ground he and he and Danny are a lot more similar than I thought they would be they're both very headstrong they don't trust people easily and they shouldn't based on their past experience and when they have a goal they're not really going to let anybody else get in the way of that goal and and when they feel that they're right that's that's it like they're right and everyone else needs to kind of deal with it that being said their advisors are the more clever uh Tyrion and Davos have kind of like a funny mirror to them like they're both very blunt they're both uh very honest and they're a little bit more savvy at kind of navigating and working people and kind of integrating themselves into the, the, the headspace of these these rulers and these leaders that they become, you know, advisors to. Between Tyrion, Danny, John, and Davos, Davos was the MVP of that episode. From his introduction of John with um, 
This is Jon Snow. He's king of the north. And that being it, after Missandei lists like eight titles for Danny, was perfect, man. It was so funny, so blunt, so perfect. And, and it just, that was pretty much Davos and Jon in a nutshell. Um, that was like, the ver that was the difference between like northerners and Targaryens. Um, and you can see why those two factions wouldn't necessarily get along and don't think they have a lot in common because one is all like, you know, all, you know, all this majesty and we're rulers and we're conquerors. And the other ones are just like, just, just get it done. They're very practical. The reason Davos stood out to me in this episode was the way he kind of jumped into the interaction with him and Miss Sunday. I don't know why that moment stuck out to me. It was just, it was just weird. Um, you know, they, they give up their weapons and then he kind of approaches Miss Sunday and was like, oh, where are you from? I can't place that accent. And she says, north and he starts oh yeah it's beautiful it's got butterflies and all this stuff and she doesn't really respond and i don't know if it was one of those situations where he's trying to break the ice establish a sense of you know familiarity and friendship and she is not gonna allow it um but it almost seemed like davos was like fishing for something and Masande like didn't bite but in not biting he became suspicious because immediately after that, he kind of drops back and tells John that everything here has changed, which is a weird thing to say because I don't know what Davos was expecting to be familiar. Like, Dragonstone wasn't inhabited before, well, after Stannis left. Nobody else has held it since then, so I don't know what he was expecting to maybe have potentially stayed the same. I'm not saying that something big is gonna come out of that interaction. It was just, it maybe was just supposed to like show how uneasy everybody is and how kind of on edge everybody is and they're trying to outthink each other. But it was it was a weird moment and I keep thinking about it. I've heard some weird theories out there from people that maybe like Masande's up to something or Davos is, is suspicious of I, I don't know, you know, and I I'm not gonna repeat them here because I didn't come up with them. Um but it, it Watching the episode, I've watched the episode twice, and both times it really stood out to me. All right, so getting to see Sansa back at Winterfell, I, I'm glad that they showed a couple quick moments of her being a leader, like actively walking around the castle, managing things, showing how everything should be, thinking ahead in ways that some of these older gentlemen that have been put in power to help her haven't foreseen. Um, and, and Baelish is right, like leadership does suit her. I thought the best moment that we were going to get back at Winterfell was Baelish pulling her aside. And he finally gets her ear where I feel like she really listened to him for the first time this season, really. His his speech about fighting all battles on all fronts in her mind, it's really good advice, one. And it also is going to be instrumental in kind of weeding into her mind and getting her to be a little bit more suspect of John Because she's going to start accounting for every eventuality. Some of those are going to be... John may be making the wrong decision or betraying her or her not being given the respect she deserves. And that's all he wants. While it's really good advice, because it seems so earnestly and honestly given, it's going to seep into her mind and it's going to be hard for her to shake those later on. I did not expect Bran to pop back up in Winterfell this episode. Once again, it seems like he got there pretty damn fast. I will give it to the show. I don't know when he actually got to the wall. And when he left the wall compared to everything else going on, I guess maybe by the time John left and got to Dragonstone, that may be enough time for Bran to leave, get to the wall and then get to Winterfell. That's cool. That's fine. I don't think it would have stood out to me as much if we didn't have all these warping armies popping up all over the place. I guess it was exciting to see those two together. I don't really remember them having a lot of well, I guess they didn't have a lot of interaction because Bran stayed back at Winterfell in season one. But it was weird. I mean, Bran's definitely changed, and I don't know that I like it. I get that he's gotten all this information basically like downloaded into his brain. I think it's a little bit cliche of them to go with the whole he's just like advanced, non-emotional, AI kind of cyborg headspace. We've seen it so many other times before. It doesn't seem original at this point. I didn't necessarily get that that would be his vibe being back with his family in Winterfell. But maybe that makes sense based on how he was interacting with the Night's Watch uh, back in the last episode. I don't for the life of me know why he would want to talk to Sansa. And the first thing that he brings up is her rape at the hands of Ramsay Bolton last time that she was at Winterfell. Even if you don't have a lot of emotion and you're kind of off because you got all this stuff popping around in your head. 
does that really seem like the best way to reintegrate with your family, especially your sister who's been like through hell and back? Like they've all been through stuff. I I get that. But really? And to be so creepy about it, he was like, your dress looked beautiful and the night was beautiful. It was just such a weird, creepy thing to do. Like, it makes me wonder, is all this stuff going to make Sansa and maybe turn against her family and feel like she's the only one, like, healthy enough or worthy enough to rule Winterfell? They've been comparing her a lot with Cersei this season, and Cersei feels wronged by men in power instead of her over the course of her life. And the way they're setting it up, it kind of makes it seem like Sansa is going to mirror that a little bit and feel that basically she's the only person that should be in charge of the Stark family household and Winterfell as a whole. Jon is a little bit impulsive and she doesn't necessarily agree with his leadership style. And then Bran kind of has gone off his rocker a little bit because he didn't even try to explain the Three-Eyed Raven thing to her. He kept saying how hard it was to explain, like that cliche of like, oh, I can't explain it, but you didn't actually try to explain it. Like, even in the most basic terms. Bran being there and acting like that makes me wonder why exactly he's there. Obviously, he needs to talk with Jon. I guess maybe he doesn't know that Jon's left because he hasn't been connected to the Weirwood network since he's been moving. However, it makes me wonder if he's really there for like safety and the comfort of home. And, you know, they also have the, the Godswood at Winterfell. Um, and is he acting like that, though, with Sansa to sever his emotional ties to his family because he knows that he can't really consider himself a Stark anymore? Like, he's not a lord. He says that he can't be the lord of anything. So maybe he's just there for the connection to the Lord Network, not necessarily for the connection to his family. And he's trying to prevent that from being a temptation for him so that he can fulfill his duty as a new Three-Eyed Raven. And it's interesting because now that he knows everything, I don't know how well he can access it, but he should know who tried to kill him. And the person that tried to kill him is at Winterfell right now. We know that Peter Baelish was behind Bran almost getting assassinated uh, in the beginning of, this, uh, of the series. Sansa's already suspicious of Baelish. Jon already hates Baelish. Having somebody there that knows <laughs> everything, including that Baelish is basically behind the entire plot of Game of Thrones... Is going to be super interesting to the odds of Baelish making it through the rest of the season. It's not looking great for the dude right now. And they zoomed in on the cat's paw dagger uh, for the preview for C uh, episode four. It could be it for Baelish. Uh, I wouldn't be disappointed. He's kind of lost his necessity, I think, to the show. He may still have a couple big moves left, but for the most part, it's looking like he's not going to make it to the end of, season, uh, of episode four, much less the end of the season. That kind of works with the northern contingent. Jumping down south with Cersei, I gotta give it up for it. She's killing it. You know, she's outthinking her enemies. She's making the most of whatever move she has. The way she kind of worked the the bank of Bravos. I think it's Bravos, right? Um, you know, I don't know who's winning this war for her. I don't know who's giving her this advice if she's coming up with this stuff on her own, but she's listening to the right people. She's making the right moves. She took advantage of Euron showing up at her door and, and pledging to give her these gifts. Because um, that dude's like 2-0. and o. I guess like 3-0 and o now. He's got like two battles and captives. And then the revenge on Ilaria was perfect. Oh my god. I kept waiting for some, some real creepy shit to happen. You know, anytime the mountain's in the room and you're in a dungeon, I didn't know if he was... I really thought... I think, I don't know what I thought. You know, he, he's, she's still got that scepter floating around somewhere that he's just like torturing repeatedly. And I guess I was waiting for him to like pop somebody's head or something like that. I think that's the most visceral thing I've ever seen in Game of Thrones was him popping um, over his head. But for her to interrogate and like Cersei to milk that moment was brilliant. And then to basically force Ilaria to endure the same pain that Cersei did specifically and then up the ante a notch with you're gonna watch her die because Cersei didn't watch Marcella die um Jamie had that you know pleasure you know being made to not only see her die but you have to sit there and like watch her decompose and just like focus on what you've done and be force-fed and brilliant like I it's just, I still don't like Cersei but that was some of the best Cersei moments that I've seen and she feels like a legitimate threat she was going a little crazy at the beginning of the season, and now she feels like she's, like, the person to beat. It was, 
it was a little creepy. She got so turned on by that and like went to Jamie and all that stuff. Um, but she's definitely drunk off her own power, and now she's drunk off of success, which she hasn't really had until like the end of season six. And now she's she's on a roll. Uh, it's interesting also her interaction with Jamie, and now that she doesn't care about anybody in the castle, you know, finding out that she and her brother are making out and doing it all the time. At the beginning of that scene, Jamie definitely said no. You know, I'm not I'm not gonna be that guy, and you're like, oh, but I mean, you know, you know, he said no. I don't. He didn't act like he believed it, but. Based on a lot of the fallout from the last time Jamie was able to make it home, um, and then the scene with her and Jamie uh, next to Joffrey's body, that was a very rapey scene. Um, and it's interesting now that, that Cersei's got all this power, that she was the one that was taking control of that scene, and Jamie was the one more hesitant and vulnerable without his hand. You know, kind of caught off guard, just kind of despondent and worn out after, you know, Euron basically just like completely shut him down. Very interesting that there's like that shift of power uh, and I think very much a commentary on the way that women are rising in, into power in this, this world of, of Westeros and the men are kind of losing some of that confidence that they've had because they haven't made the right moves. A couple more points on, on the Cersei storyline. Um, Alaria and I think her daughter's name is Tyene. That last scene of Cersei walking out of the dungeon and them like straining to get to each other and they're held back by these chains um, seemed very similar to the way they described the Mad King basically burning alive Ned Stark's father and brother because basically he had them like chained up, he burned the dad, and then the son was like in this contraption where all he had to do was like get out of it to to rescue his father but the harder he strained the harder it choked him and so he basically like hung himself like choked himself to death trying to reach his father as he burned in front of him i don't think they've really talked a lot about that in the show it's very explicit in the books and so i wonder if that's another callback in in comparison to the mad king and then cersei becoming the new mad queen and I wonder how Jamie's going to take that because Jamie was, I think he was there for Ned Stark's brother and father brutally executed in front of everybody. Um, and they made a lot of references to that in this episode because it was a, it was a big part of John and Danny's conversation at the beginning. Quick HBO thing. I'm assuming that when Lena Hetty got out of the bed with Jamie, I'm assuming that was a body double because they were careful not to show her face. Um, and the, it, the hair looked a little bit different when she got out of the bed and then it cut back to Jamie and then she was like putting on the robe. And I know Lena had to use the body double for the scene of her walking down the street doing the walk of shame. If they're going to use a body double, it, 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 do we really need like tits and ass that much in the show? It, can we not go like an episode without... It's, it's not a necessity like HBO. Like everybody loves Game of Thrones. Like you don't... I hope it wasn't a body double simply for the fact that I hope that they didn't like pay somebody and film that shot just for the sake of having Cersei's to the show. It just seems completely ridiculous at this point. Maybe it was her, but it wasn't like vital to the story that we see that. And I'm assuming that Lena Headey didn't, you know, didn't do it herself because of past instances on the show. I don't know. I can't think of a scene where we for sure know that it was Lena Headey, um... I don't know. I know that's an HBO thing. It's like cable. Oh, we can show nudity, so let's do it. But it, it's not necessary. It was also great to see Jamie get his own little storyline arc in this episode. Um, super disappointing that we didn't see any of the battle between the Lannister men and the Tyrells. I also did not remember that the Tyrells were not supposed to be capable fighters in this version. Um, I never got that sense in the books. In fact, in the books, the Tyrells are such a threat because they're wealthy, they have a lot of grain and agriculture, they, they live in a comfortable part of Westeros where it's like a good standard of living for the majority of the people. I think it's like fairly well protected, they have a massive castle, and I think they have a pretty large standing army. Obviously, Loras is a, a really one of the best fighters in the, in the, the series at this point, uh, in the books. He's still alive, obviously in the show he's not. Uh, I don't remember anything about them being like that pathetic fighting where it would just be a complete walkover. Maybe I'm just misremembering. It's been a while since I've read those books, but 
or maybe that was just like the show's way of breezing through that battle and making it seem like something that we weren't missing out. We didn't really see enough of High Guard, I think, to make it count for like a spectacle. Uh, the shot of Jamie walking through the castle uh, and you know going straight to Elena was really cool. And then their combination, obviously, anything with the Queen of Thorns is going to be fantastic. I, you know, I was, um, I, I, I like seeing that mercy that Jamie showed her with you know letting him know that. He pretty much talked Cersei down into giving her painless death. I um, I never thought he was lying. I thought that he was going to give her the poison and Cersei just bullshitted him. And then she was going to die in the same way that, that Joffrey died. Especially because Cersei was very careful to use the same poison that Ilaria used on Marcella, on uh, Ilaria's daughter. So I assumed that she was going to start like going purple and like choking herself and all that kind of stuff. A complete boss move by... Elena Tyrell to just down that drink. I mean, she chugged the whole glass of wine, no fear, no hesitation. And her letting Jamie know that she was behind Joffrey's murder was fantastic. Both of the actors in that scene were amazing. Seeing Jamie's face as he kind of realizes, like, damn, not only did she she kill my son, she's like getting the last laugh at me as she's getting ready to die. And I gave her an easy way out. Like, there is no revenge to be had for that. That being said, House Tyrell is dead, and they're one of my favorite houses. Um, I hope that that's not how it's going to end for them in the books, because I really like them. The only other major part of this episode that I remember uh, was catching up with Sam uh, over in Old Town. And as much as I love Sam, and as much as the kind of, like, magical warping armies and geography skipping is, is getting a little bit ridiculous, this was the most ridiculous part of the episode. <laughs> I don't know how long it's been since Sam like cut off all Jorah's skin. One, I thought that that would take longer than a night. I thought that, that would be something like he had to come back and keep doing that. But he's healed that fast. Like one operation, it cutting off the, the outer layer of skin and putting some lotion on it. I mean, if it was that, I know it's not easy to flay somebody, I guess, you know, to cut... If the operation was that simple to cure, like, one of the most feared diseases in the entire world, why haven't more people done this? Like, you you cut off the, the outer layer and you rub some lotion on it? Like, as soon as people get grayscale, all they need to do is, like, head on over to a maester and get the part scraped off and some lotion on it. Like, that thing took up, like, two-thirds of his, of his torso. I mean... Obviously, jorah has got something important to do for the rest of this. They're getting him in and out that fast. You know, episode one, he was still messed up. Episode two at the end, you know, they kind of start. And then after that, it's done. I mean, he's even started, like, scabbing and healing. He's still got, like, feeling, too. I thought maybe he would at least, like, lose that side of his body or something. Um, I, I just don't. That, like, there's dragons. There are warping ships and magic in this world and that is like one of the most ridiculous things i've seen and then on top of that like i guess maybe they don't know about like airborne stuff like they're not wearing a mask or anything but sam touched him like with no gloves or anything he just like shook his hand and then he made sure to jordan made sure to do like the double clasp and then jordan like put on the same clothes that he's been wearing the entire time put on some new clothes you don't need to wear the same clothes that have like grayscale all in them. Is it like chicken pox where once you get it, you can't really get it again? Even still, like if I had something like that, even if they were like, you'll never get it again, I'm burning all that shit. I'm burning the clothes. I'm like shaving my head, all of it. I want brand new stuff, brand new clothes. I want brand new air. I guess maybe it shows like how nice Sam is and I don't think that they're gonna have him get grayscale or anything like that. But how exactly does that disease work? Because None of the rules that apply to like realistic, contagious diseases seem to apply in this case. I'm not a medical expert. I'm not an expert on anything, really. I just know how I would react. And I'm sorry, dude. I'm not touching you. Not happening. Like, I guess on one hand, like it's good because Sam is going to get a little bit more leeway and trust in in learning more information and kind of showing like his talent. Uh, and it was funny that that the Archmaster still punishes him. Uh, because I expect some Harry Potter type shit where he just like does whatever he wants to do 
and then because it worked out, like awarded. But uh, so it was interesting that Sam still kind of has to perform these these tasks. But I have a feeling that when he's transcribing those books, there's going to be some information in there that's going to be useful to him that maybe he wouldn't have gotten access to for a long time. The Archmaster said those are really old books. Uh, they're rotting. They need to be preserved. So maybe this is something that people haven't read and haven't looked into in a while. And Sam is going to be basically one of the only people to know the information that they hold uh, in the current time and place. So um, at this point, I don't have Sterling here to do uh, predictions with me. Based on the way things are shaping up, the people on the chopping block for me right now, in the next, I'm talking about like the next couple episodes, like, we're already hitting episode four next week. I think we have seven or eight in this season. I think it's seven. Um, I don't know if Baelish is going to make it past, like, episode five. Jamie looks like he's on the chopping block because Daenerys is done playing around. She's ready to go burn some stuff. There was a shot in the trailer... Uh, released before the season of Jamie like kind of charging into this fiery field. I think he might be done, but you know, he could live because a lot of people still think that he's going to be the person to kill Cersei. It looks like the White Walker stuff is going to be what ends the season. So I don't know if we're going to see the Brotherhood Without Banners at all until maybe like episode six or seven. Even though I have, I'm having some problems with how realistic the, the war is being fought, by far the best episode of the season. Episode two was a little bit weak for me. Um, this one was, was just about perfect. Curious as to how Yara maybe is gonna get out of her situation. Cersei doesn't really have a reason to kill Yara. She definitely probably is gonna wanna keep her prisoner. But Theon's gonna have to get brought back into the fray somehow. And uh, we didn't see any Arya today or, or this past week. So I'm expecting to see some of her, especially now that dagger popped back up. She was pictured with it in a uh, like promotional photo. Um, it could just be that maybe it was for the promotional photo. But the way they keep showing that dagger, man, I think it's got to be important later on. And I wonder if it's going to be one of those situations where that's Bran's proof that Baelish is the one that set everything in motion. Thank you guys so much for uh, sticking around. Uh, thank you uh, all the people that have been watching and supporting. Uh, it's a small channel, but we're growing. Uh, I haven't promoted it much, but we will. If you have any uh, suggestions, of course, you know, we always love to hear them. And if you have any points on uh, episode three of season seven of Game of Thrones, please feel free to hit us up in the comments. Tweet me, Sean at Rabble, Sean, S-E-A-N underscore at underscore Rabble. Tweet me, like, let me know if you you think I'm missing something or if you have a great theory that you'd like to share. It was super fun going over this episode. Hope to get the other ones up uh, throughout the course of the season because this season could be, like, the one that Game of Thrones is remembered for. Check out some more videos at Rabble. Hope you enjoy them, and be sure to tune in for the next one. Later.